Coming up on Tech News Today, we talk to Mike Elgin, who's live from Barcelona for the Mobile World Congress. We pick up the pieces of net neutrality and talk about a tattoo of a dress on some guy's leg. That's all today on Tech News Today. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today for Monday, March 2nd, 2015. This episode of Tech News Today is brought to you by Prosper. Prosper is a peer to peer lending marketplace connecting people who are looking to borrow money with people who have money to lend. Visit prosper.com slash twit and receive a $50 Visa gift card when you get a loan. And this episode is brought to you by Personal Capital. With Personal Capital, you get award-winning financial tools, unbiased advice, and a transparent view of all your investments. Best of all, it's free. To sign up, go to personalcapital.com slash TNT. Good Monday morning. Tech News Today is the show where we talk about the tech news with the journalists who report it. I'm Megan Maroney filling in for Mike Elgin, who's luckily in Barcelona at the Mobile World Congress. And joining me today is Joe Panettiere, illustrious offsite co-host and After Nine's content czar. Welcome, Joe. Good to be here, Megan. How you been? I've been good. I'm excited to take the host seat. It's been nice so far. I yeah, guess you've I, got the conch. <laughs> yeah, I do. And uh, speaking of who I'm filling in for, joining us live from Mobile World Congress in Barcelona is our news director. He hasn't left for good yet, Mike Elgin. Hey, how's it going, Megan? It's going, I don't know, how's it going? Going great. It's so easy to do the show when you're not the host. <laughs> <laughs> so you've been in Barcelona for a few days. Uh, yep. And uh, what have you seen? What have you heard? Tell us all about it. All right. Well, it's a pretty crazy show. We've had uh, a lot of rumors to sort of confirm with the actual information. Most of the rumors from the big companies like HTC and Samsung have been true. Some of the rumors have not panned out. But uh, I was at the HTC event yesterday, and we did a few interviews uh, to capture some of the highlights, some of the big products that were there. So let's take a look at uh, those interviews. So can you tell us about the M9? Yeah, sure. So the M9 um, has a beautiful design. We've designed it so it's almost like a beautiful piece of jewellery. So you wear it every day and you wear it with pride. We have the gunmetal grey at the minute uh, with the brushed hairline effects and then smoothed off around the edges. So one of the main things that we have added as well is uh, HTC Sense 7. What this has done here is bought a beautiful little box. What this does is track where you are and then change your apps accordingly. So we have home, we have out, and we have work. Those apps will give you suggestions down here as to what you use most and pop them into your screen. That, that's cool. This is a, so it's a context aware set of apps that it learns, I imagine, uh, as you use apps, it sees that when you're home, you tend to use this app and so on. Yeah, so it learns that by GPS signal. So all you have to do is click on here then click onto the menu button. If you set a location, you can choose where, what location you want where. So. At each location, it will learn from yourself what you use the most. Suggest them if you want to suggest. If you want the suggested apps, all you have to do: click on it, hold it down, and drag it into the front screen. Nice. Okay. So, can you tell us a bit about the uh, the new camera setups, okay. front and back? Yeah, sure. So, in the new camera setups, what we've done is added a 20 megapixel camera to the back. The reason we've done that is because we were listening to consumers and they wanted megapixels, so that we did exactly that. But a lot of them did like um, our ultra pixel camera, which we have just relocated to the front. Now, is that exactly the same camera that used to be on the back and then it's now on the front? Yeah. It, obviously, the aperture is slightly different, but we have moved the camera to the front. And it's optimized for selfies, obviously. Exactly. So um, we, it brings in 300% more light. And obviously, with a front-facing camera, that's kind of what we want. <laughs> okay. And how about the sound system? I know that uh, HTC, uh, the HTC One line has always been kind of famous for its front-facing speakers and good sound. So uh, has that been improved in this model? It has indeed, yeah. So it's been improved by we've paired it with Dolby. So we now have uh, Dolby enables in our speakers. So when listening to films or to music, we are able to change whether it be... Um, uh, whether it be just for music or whether it be for a movie. So that way you get the surround sound feel 
to your music or even to your movies. Now, if somebody is a current user of the current uh, HTC One, uh, w will they want to upgrade to this, or, or is this uh, just a, a, an incremental upgrade from the, the old version? Uh, what would you recommend to those people? I would recommend to, uh, upgrade to the M9 any day because you're getting that little bit more experience, you're getting that little bit more wow factor, and just the overall finish as well as what's happening on in the inside is just absolutely amazing. Any other, uh, any other new features that you want to talk about today? Um, off the top of my head, no, I think we're good. Other than we've got Lollipop running. So Lollipop is obviously bright, colourful and fantastic. And um, one other thing actually is the themes. I don't know if you've, if you listened to, have you heard about the themes? Uh, yes, but why don't you uh, tell us about those? Awesome. Right. So themes is uh, now an app. What it does is it actually gives you like a store as such, but they are all free. So you can choose any of these themes and what it does is changes everything within the phone. Okay, so it changes your front screen as well as your ringtones as well as your widgets. You can go into those and edit them yourself or as we've got this backdrop here, you can take pictures and you can do live, um, live themes of your own. Okay, so if I show you. So this shows you exactly what it will look like. Okay. And you can download that and pop it straight onto your front screen. We're talking to Marquez as uh, one of the premier reviewers of smartphones about the new M9. So overall, what did you think of this phone? Uh, it was impressive. I, I knew a lot of what to expect. Obviously, we've seen really impressive stuff from the One M7 and M8. Uh, so the biggest change is the camera. So I'm really excited to get my hands on it, see what the photos look like, see what the videos look like. But the design, the speakers, everything is also really impressive already. So the weird thing about the camera was they put the ultra pixel on the front facing camera and they put a 20 megapixel camera on the back. What do you think about that? Why did they do that? Why didn't they keep mega, uh, ultra pixel in the back and why did they move it to the front? Yeah, I think they, they want to emphasize the fact that you can take low light shots and wide angle shots and selfies are just kind of like a spur of the moment thing. I see selfies all around here and the lighting's terrible. Mm -hmm. So that's what ultra pixel is supposed to be good for. Hopefully it'll work well there, but I think the back facing camera, you want a little bit more versatility, so hopefully the 20 megapixels will bring that and better low light shots and everything else. The HTC One has always been famous for its speakers. It has front facing speakers and great sound. Now they added Dolby. Do you think this is a significant improvement or is this just a slight incremental improvement? I think it's nice to bring a name on board that wants to be associated with it, but I don't know if it's going to make a big difference. I've heard awesome audio out of the One M8 speakers, so I'll have to hear it for myself, but I think it'll be really good as usual. And, and of course, the, uh, the big uh, controversy of this, I think, when we heard the rumors, and I think most or all of the rumors are pretty much true, uh, was that it would be incremental. Would this be a, you know, they kind of needed to hit one out of the park, do something really, uh, uh, you know, off the wall. And this is pretty much just a slightly better version of the old phone. Do you think that's going to hurt them or is that is that the way to go? I think a lot of what people expect when they say big change is a new design. So even if they change nothing about it and just change the internal specs, they would say, oh, it's an incremental improvement. So I think they have a good design going for them. I think it's good that they kept it. Is it incremental? Yeah, I guess, but I don't have any problems with it. Can you tell us about the HCC grip? Yes, sir. It's and sports bands is designed to take people that are heavily athletic up to the next level. So they can utilize all the uh, assets from UA Record, which is the uh, new application for Amandurano, a partnership with the band, to actually review the data that they've collected from their workouts, from their runs, from their cycles, etc. like that, and actually make that decision of what worked. Did I uh, have a great meal the night before? Did I have that good coach and control? And, and actually with the UA records, you have access to all those athletes that Under Armour have uh, uh, under their branding as well. So it's a really way of, of getting the most out of uh, your exercise. It appears to be a co-branded uh, device. Are they going to, is Under Armour going to sell it themselves in their own channels? So at the moment it's, uh, it's going to be launched in America and we're about to announce the uh, distribution for the America, but we actually aren't announcing anything else other than it is a co-branded device and, and it's, it's planned uh, uh, use and for, for those athletes. Now you're claiming a high accuracy. How are you achieving that? So with the high accuracy, it is something that is, is two modes. For obviously you have the ability with the five cent different senses to, to track your, your, your walking, your steps, etc. like that. But the reason it's incredibly high accuracy is if you say, for example, choose a run, it will turn on the GPS that's integrated into that band mm -hmm. to track every precise location of your run. So that's why it's much more high accuracy than, uh, than a normal fitness band. Okay, wonderful. You can go ahead and zoom in on this, uh, on one of these devices, maybe that one there. And so, uh, so the viewers can get a good look at that. Now, 
Go ahead. You were yeah, it's a, it, in terms of the band itself, it's a, a really great screen in terms it ha has a, a technology, it's called P AMOLED, and it's it's really uh, crisp and, and detailed and able to be seen on, on most angles. So it is a beautiful screen, but we're not actually showing it working here. We're still actually in that, that development stage. We didn't want people to uh, to have that experience, but it, it's, a, it's a solid band uh, that uh, links around and comes in three different sizes, small, medium, large, and multiple colors, as, as you're seeing the main color in the, uh, in the box there. Now you're using both G GPS and a pedometer and with the GPS on you have one battery metric and with it off you have another one. Can you talk about that? So the, the first battery metric obviously with general use every day it's, uh, it's a couple of days, two to three days. That's what we'd expect people to get out of it. When you turn on GPS that's obviously a much higher consuming activity and we expect about a five hour battery life with the, uh, with the GPS turned on on the device. Price and availability? I'm afraid it's something that we're uh, we're announced nearer the time. It's, it, it'll be rolling out uh, in America first, where obviously the Under Armour, Under Armour is one of the go-to brands, and then we're going to establish that and, and and look at that for the rest of the world. Well, thank you, Mike. So the HTC One Nine, that was the the phone that I had some questions about. It looks like, uh, like you said, it's not really that different. But the reviewer and of course the person that was there selling the phone. Um, didn't seem to really care. Did uh, do you see a real difference between the one eight and the one nine? Well, you know, uh, the thing to keep in mind is that HTC has a similar model as Apple, whereas instead of like Samsung does, they come out with uh, a large number of phones running the entire gamut from the low end phones to the highest end phones. They have the one phone you, they really really want you to buy, um, and so like Apple, which tends to do subtle in incremental upgrades to a phone that everybody already loves. I mean, remember that uh, that HCC fans uh, who own an HCC One uh, tend to really, really love them. They are beautifully designed. They're, they're, there's aluminum. They actually, when they first came out, people said they look like something Apple would design. They don't look like Apple's actual designs, but something they might design. They kind of look... They kind of remind you a little bit more of Apple's laptops than they do of Apple's phones. But nevertheless, they have a very subtle elegance to them and beautiful speakers, really great sound. Uh, they had some interesting camera tricks and other benefits that made people really love this phone. So if they were to change it radically, they might turn off a lot of, the, of their most rabid fans. And if they upgrade it significantly uh, or even subtly... It's just a better version of a phone that those fans already love. What they won't be doing is gaining new fans. They won't be peeling people away from the iPhone. They won't be stealing users from any other Android phone, from Samsung's or whatever. Uh, they're playing to the base. They want to hang on to their base. And I think the existing users, especially the ones who had two generations back, are going to love it. Um, so if you, you either love the phone or you don't, if you do, this is a be the best version of the HCC One there is. Especially if you take a lot of selfies, I guess, since the selfie Especially camera. Especially if you take, and who doesn't, right? Especially in darkness, which this is going to be great for. Right. Well, I think Joe has some questions about the other big news that was announced today. Yeah, Samsung, Mike. Um, tell me a little bit more about what you're seeing and hearing from Samsung out of the show. I know you mentioned the phone, but, you know, I'm wondering if this if this event and what Samsung is showing off can sort of be the the uh, the big event of the year to to jumpstart them, for lack of a better term? I mean, you think back to the uh, the iPhone 6 launch and how that just propelled Apple so far forward. And I'm not saying that Apple was so revolutionary in their technology, but they finally came out with a big screen and really turbocharged things. What about Samsung here? Well, Samsung is in a weird position because I think they've been moving and in the wrong direction more than just about any other phone company on the market, handset company on the market. And uh, if you look at the fourth quarter, if the fourth quarter of 2014 was a disaster for Samsung in equal measure to the degree to which it was a spectacular quarter for Apple, because what happened is essentially the uh, two companies used to be the only companies that were significantly profitable with Apple historically, you know, historically meaning the last two years or so, uh, getting about two thirds of the industry profits by itself and Samsung getting about one third of the industry's profits by itself. And, and of course, Samsung being the number one uh, vendor in terms of unit sales. So at the end of the, la of the fourth quarter of last year, Apple had 93% of the industry profits and Samsung was down to nine. So Samsung came out early in the smartphone market, in the Android smartphone market, with a brilliant strategy of going from the very low end to the very high end. They aggressively market in Africa and in uh, China and a lot of other uh, countries. And before China had this thriving 
low-cost, high-quality smartphone market. Samsung was that phone for the Chinese market. They were huge in China. So now what's happening is the Huawei's and the Lenovo's and the, and the Xiaomi's and the ZTE's are clobbering Samsung in China, and Apple's clab clobbering them on the high, profitable end of the market. Yeah. And Samsung has very little maneuvering room. And so this was their big opportunity to really, really shine. So when they did this event, their uh, their announcement was unlike anything I've ever seen. It was so, uh, to be in the room, it was so loud. It was almost scary to be in the room with an incredibly loud, <laughs> the whole message was, we are Samsung. We are the most powerful company in the history of mankind. We dominate, you know, and it was a very kind of like clobber you over the head presentation. And when they tried to get a lot of rise out of the out of the audience, they didn't get much, really. They, they tried to, you know, stick it to Apple a couple of times during the presentation. So what they're going for is just... Uh, clearly superior in every single way. That was their message. And they specifically called out Apple for having inferior low-light photography in the iPhone compared with the new Samsung. And they really bragged about that. So they're going after the... They're hitting all the right notes. They've got some great um, camera technology. They've got some great battery technology claiming that they can get a 50% charge in 10 minutes and that they can charge twice as fi fast as the iPhone 6. That's what people want to hear. Uh, unfortunately... There are some other problems with this phone uh, for fans. For example, they, uh, Samsung uh, used to have uh, replaceable batteries, unlike the iPhone, which never did. And now the new Samsung doesn't have replaceable batteries. Uh, they got rid of some of the waterproofing, which used to be one of the benefits of a Samsung phone. And, and so, you know, fans are complaining about the new Galaxy S6, but it has to be said that I think personally, and this is a controversial point, a lot of people saying it's a gimmick, a lot of people saying they love it, I love it, is the, uh, the, get, the Galaxy 6S Edge, which has the curved screen on the outside, that was a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a super clear differentiation from any other phone on the market. No other uh, company has ever made a phone that curves on both sides out to the out like uh, at the outside like that and they've got you know special user interface gimmicks there as well so i think overall i don't think they just to, you know get back to what's important for samsung i don't think they succeeded in their goal of just really hitting back uh at apple and the iphone as hard as they wanted to because this isn't really going to do it well do you have any idea why they did back off on like the the waterproof features I and mean, that was the big thing last year for the S5 and you know you can throw it in water and submerse it and even the one the non-sport version was pretty waterproof um why did they back off and just move into like the metal and glass case do you any idea why yes i do because they they are packing so much ultra advanced technology into a very very thin phone this is actually one of the challenges that apple has as well this is a very thin sm phone very small very light compared to you know if you think about what's in there just one example is that they've they've got this um wireless charging built in uh, that supports both wpc and pma it's built right into the phone uh, you don't need a case or any any extra thing it's just wireless charging built into this phone They've got a really amazing camera in there, which actually sticks out a bit. Remember, the iPhone got a little bit of flack for having a camera that sort of didn't, uh, you know, it went beyond the flush uh, flatness of the of the back. This does that in a big way. So they, they're really packing a ton of technology in there, you know, lots of memory, lots of power. The, the screen is just a, a, an, an insane screen, 577 pixels per inch, this screen, 77% more pixels than the previous uh, Samsung Galaxy. Um, you know, so they, they're just jamming so much technology that they had to make trade-offs. You can't quite have it all. And so they made some decisions. And, and I think they've got that, uh, that iPhone envy because they basically said, well, Apple's uh, taking us to the cleaners with a, a phone that doesn't have a removable battery. So if we take it out, then that's not going to be something where we're going to be vulnerable and Apple gets away with it. So maybe we can get away with it, that sort of thing. So it's, it's a, uh, you know, they, they're, they're going after materials too. They've always had a a history of having a lot of plastic in their uh, in their phones. Now they're going metal, and they're saying that their metal is 50% stronger than other phones. That's a nebulous claim, but still, they're, they're, they're emphasizing the Gorilla Glass 4, uh, which is the latest version of Gorilla Glass they claim is the strongest glass in the world, and that the metal is 50% stronger. So they're going after hyper-durability as well. And, uh, and you know, they're good-looking phones, especially the Edge, I think, is really great. Um, but that's that's essentially the problem. They have to make trade-offs with a phone that small, that thin, at that price, with all that technology. 
Yeah, Mike, speaking about trade-offs, let's shift a little bit over to wearables and, and all the challenges that the uh, the vendors there are having in terms of just how much feature and functionality to put in there. So we're away, uh, about a week away from, from the Apple Watch launch, allegedly, next week. Um, how much buildup is there at this conference, Mobile World uh, Conference, in terms of the wearable market? Who's making the most noise? And, and what are the, the key themes you're hearing ahead of Apple's news next week? Well, one of the things that I've noticed, and, and this isn't the, the message that they want to get out there, but one of the things that I've noticed is that they're, these fitness bands that are like the Microsoft Band or some of these other fitness bands that have been around, everybody's got one now. Every single smartphone maker, it seems, the major ones, have a fitness band that looks more or less like the Microsoft band or any of the others. Z ZTE's got one. Everybody's got one. And so that, that category is becoming rapidly commoditized. Yes, there are some differentiators, especially for the Microsoft band, which is probably one of the most uh, unusual standouts in that category. But still, at first glance, they look identical. You know, you, it'd be hard to tell them apart. At the higher end, Android Wear, of course, is huge. And there's a lot of competition in Android Wear, but of course, it's Android Wear. So the OS is exactly what you'd expect for the most part. Um, one of the most interesting things that is happening around this is that LG has a, uh, a smartphone, a uh, smartwatch called the uh, Urbane. Now, that one of their Urbanes, they have two models. One is an Android Wear watch. It's like a, it's like a metal, you know, high end. It looks beautiful. It looks like a really, you know, expensive watch, basically. Uh, and that's running Android Wear, but they have another one that's running, I'm hearing that it's running WebOS, although I don't know if they've confirmed wow. that or not, but it's not Android Wear. And that one uh, supports LTE, and you can make phone calls with it without a phone. So that's another area. But, the, you know, the, the, as with every single Mobile World Congress, the elephant in the living room is Apple. Uh, everybody's trying to, you know, I, I mentioned before that they've got 93% of the smartphone market, and this is a smartphone show, and they're not even there. And of course, they're there everywhere. If you look at all the products, everybody's trying to figure out how to deal with the Apple problem. And the Apple Watch is going to be another big problem because no other smart watch that I've seen that's you know got any chance at all of, of thrilling the mainstream has a screen like that, has the advanced haptics combined with other interface elements that are going to give it this, this weird, warm and fuzzy feel to it. Uh, and hardly any other smartphone even has a prayer of, uh, uh, commanding the kind of numbers. I mean, I expect the Apple Watch to sell more than every other smartwatch in the industry within the first couple of days. That's my own prediction. And I think they're going to go on from there. So they're really going to dominate that category. And it's going to be very difficult for other companies to keep up. Well, another uh, company made a big announcement, Silent Circle, announced uh, in Barcelona a new security-focused uh, mobile phone. What was their announcement? So Silent Circle is a really interesting company because this is a company that makes a phone called the Black Phone. And the Black Phone used to um, work with Silent Circle software to have a secure um, package, a complete package. Now they've essentially merged and, and they're announcing the Black Phone 2, which is a 5.5-inch phone. It's, they, they brag about it being no, nothing fancy. They brag about the fact that it doesn't have curved glass. They brag about the fact that it isn't waterproof. Uh, they, they, they brag about how plain it is, but they tell you that it's the most secure phone in the world. $629, just like their original version. It's just an incremental upgrade. If you've been following the black phone um, market on Tech News Today, uh, we've been covering it a few times. It's the same phone, but a little better. What's really crazy is they announced, but didn't announce specifics, uh, a black phone plus, which is a seven, it appears to be a seven inch tablet with all the security features of the black phone, but... It's actually a phone. It's a seven-inch phone. And so their, their thinking is that you're not going to have both a large-ish phone and also a small tablet. You're going to have one or the other, so let's make them both a phone. I think that actually makes a lot of sense, especially if you use a Bluetooth headset to make calls. Why not have your small tablet be a phone? Right, and so, if it doesn't look like a phone, that's even more privacy. Exactly. And so they, they've got – and they also announced that they have a, a, an operating system called the Private OS – and uh, they have a, a suite of, of uh, services called the Silent Suite, which is a bunch of phone and texting and, and map applications. One of the, a couple of weird things about this company, one of them is that two of the founders or two of the you know, leading executives uh, in this company, John Callis uh, and Phil Zimmerman, these are co-creators of PGP, 
which is an email, you know, it's a pretty sure. good privacy. This is a this is an encryption for email. This phone has everything, everything, conferencing, everything that's super secure, except email. That's the one app they don't have. And they say they're working on it. They said, don't worry, we're going to have it eventually. Uh, but right now they don't have it. Um, and so that was kind of funny. The other interesting thing that they said was there have been revelations recently that the NSA has been doing crazy stuff like intercepting devices as they're being mailed through the post office, taking those devices and installing stuff in the devices and then sending them on, or they're doing it at the factory. And and Silent Circle is is very proud of the fact that they control the entire chain from manufacturing to shipping, so that the NSA can never get their grubby mitts on these on these devices. Uh, so that's part of their security promise that they never just throw it in the mail and ship it off, uh, because they don't trust the government. They don't trust any government. They're very kind of anti-government. This company, and so it was a really interesting announcement. And we're going to have a an interview with the CEO that uh, that I did today. That's going to be on uh, Twitch shows. Uh, either later today or later this week. So, uh, so look for that. So you're saying the black phone is better than just wrapping my um, iPhone 6 in aluminum foil, which is what I do now. No, privacy. nothing beats aluminum foil. <laughs> okay. But put the aluminum foil on your head. <laughs> okay, got it. Uh, so what did Microsoft announce today? They had some new phones. Are they yeah, interesting? Yeah, they, they did. Well, they're... they're <laughs> Not really, uh, <laughs> but they are know. new. Yeah, they are. They are new phones, and and so Microsoft is is out there. Um, everybody wants Microsoft to announce, you know, a phone that competes with the iPhone or the the HTC um, One or the you know Samsung Galaxy S6, and they didn't yet. So they announced the Lumia 640 and the Lumia 640 XL, which is a 5.7 inch version. Uh, these are these are respectable phones. Uh, they come with a bunch of free uh, Microsoft stuff, like free Office 365 personal for a year. Um, you know, they're they're good mid-range phones that are going to probably be uh, priced uh, very affordably. In fact, um, the the 640 is going to sell for around 155. The 640 XL is probably going to be around 245. Uh, pretty interesting stuff. Another thing that they did surprise us with, which is kind of a minor thing but kind of appealing, is that they have this universal foldable keyboard that's going to work with iPads, iPhones, Android devices, Windows tablets, everything else. It's just going to be this keyboard that you can carry around that's portable. And these things used to be, this category of keyboard used to be popular and they kind of fell out of fashion and it's great to see somebody wanting to bring them back. But uh, that's what Microsoft announced. Not super exciting, but uh, but it's nice to, to see them continuing with, uh, you know, with additional uh, phones. Yeah, Mike, in addition to those phones, what's been interesting is, is as they double down on their phone effort, they're still continuing to to double down on the apps effort, right? In other words, are you starting to hear about vendors there, Android phone makers who are bundling Microsoft apps on their Android devices? You hear about it here and there, but I mean, the, 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 it's just a, I think it's an inevitable result of the fact that Microsoft is now embracing these other platforms, especially Android, uh, with its own suite. If they had done this a few years ago, I think that they'd be in a much right. better position as a software. You know, I think they for a while they forgot that they were a software maker. I mean, it used to be for many, many years, the number one application maker on the, the Macintosh platform was Microsoft. They were happy to have that position. Apple, um, you know, Apple has always... Uh, attracted uh, big spenders, and so Microsoft dominated that platform far more than they did the Windows platform at, for a certain number of years. And so they kind of forgot about that under Balmer and started just driving home Windows, 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 and and they tried to drive use, usage of Windows by neglecting other platforms with their applications. And now, uh, and this did start under Balmer, but continues very strongly under Satya Nadella. They are really embracing iOS and Android. And I think that's gonna I, th I think that's gonna help them a lot, but I think it will take a while because the uh, user bases of iOS and Android are not super thrilled about or knowledgeable about or familiar with Microsoft applications. Well, I think that the people that use Samsung Galaxies, they I for one, I have the S5 and has a lot of bloatware on it, so I'll be excited about the next phone that will have uh, Microsoft apps built in. But yeah, definitely. It looks like it is getting to be evening there for you, Mike. So, uh, anything else before we leave you? Uh, no, just that it's an exciting show. We put a bunch of uh, uh, interviews on tape and lots of stuff today, and we're going to do a lot more tomorrow. So, the see, the uh, Mobile World Congress cover coverage is going to keep coming all week. So, make sure you tune in to live.twit.tv and a number of other uh, Twitch shows uh, in the downloads for our Mobile World Congress coverage.
All right, and that'll be at 6 a.m. at live.twit.tv, and uh, we'll be showing it, like Mike said. Thank you so much, Mike. We will see you again today and tomorrow. Thank you so much. Face it, there aren't many good ways to borrow money when you need it. Friends, family, credit card companies, and traditional bank loans. But now, with a low fixed rate loan with Prosper.com, there's a better way. Borrow up to $35,000 in as few as five days and use the money for just about anything you desire. Pay off high-rate credit cards, fix up the house, even put it into your business. Prosper's online marketplace connects people who need money with those who want to invest in you. Don't rack up more debt on your credit cards. Pay them off with Prosper. To check your low rate instantly without affecting your good credit, go to prosper.com slash twit. Now and for a limited time, Prosper is offering Twit viewers a $50 Visa gift card with your low interest loan. You can get up to $35,000 in your account in as few as five days and a $50 Visa gift card. Go to prosper.com slash twit for this special offer just for Twit viewers. Let's move on to some other stories we're covering today. On Thursday, the FCC passed new rules that would ensure net neutrality, or would it? While Tom Wheeler was kicking back in his easy chair watching the entire season of House of Cards, Jason Abrazizi from Mashable says the fight isn't over yet. Welcome, Jason. Thanks for having me. So what's left to talk about? So now that we've got the rules in place, uh, we're going to actually get to see the, you know, the really nitty gritty of this new proposal, hopefully this week, maybe next week, uh, when, you know, they're kind of really done um, taking comments on it and finalizing the actual language. Once we see that, we're going to have a much better idea of, you know, really, you know, if, if some of the, uh, you know, worst case scenario things that had been brought up by the ISPs uh, comes to fruition, we're going to see also, I'm sure at that point, uh, the lawsuits will start ramping up. Comcast has said they think this will lead to years of, um, uh, you, know, le uh, you know, legal challenges. Uh, Tom Wheeler himself has also said, you know, they're, you know, fully expecting uh, to, to end up in court over this. They've already been to court twice. You know, both times uh, the, the rules got thrown out, but, you know, the FCC seems relatively confident that, uh, you know, they can survive another court challenge. But that's the that's the immediate next thing that we're going to be seeing. Hey, Jason, most of the noise I've heard from the ISPs or, or the broadband providers has involved Comcast and Comcast. I think they made a statement along the lines of, hey, we're going to have to rethink our entire broadcast and uh, broadband investment strategy. Is Comcast the only broadband provider that's screaming this loudly? And, and is this a bluff or is there something to it all in terms of the, the concerns they're trying to raise? Sure, they're definitely not the only one. Um, AT&T and Verizon have also both, you know, been pretty aggressive in saying that, you know, these new rules are going to stifle our ability to invest in a network because, you know, it's going to be, uh, you know, I mean, a lot of insecurity with, you know, how much return we can expect on that. Uh, a lot of people will tell you that that's a bluff. I, I think the truth lies somewhere in the middle. Certainly, uh, if the ISPs, you know, have a legitimate case and can't really, you know, uh, feel secure in the sense that if we invest, we're going to see a good return on on this network, then yeah, we're going to see, uh, you know, a cutback. Uh, I think it's all going to depend once, you know, the lawyers really get a hold of this language and we start seeing, you know, a little bit more security uh, in in what's coming down, you know, down the road in the next few years. You know, what the ISPs have said, you know, more than anything else is just that, you know, it's the insecurity that is going to uh, affect our businesses and, you know, not knowing how these rules are going to affect, you know, our bottom line, how they're going to affect our business relationships, you know, without that secure knowledge, you know, we can't, uh, you know, f make a business call to invest in, in our, our network. So, so as this uh, continues, I know consumers and the, the common man uh, and woman were really uh, important in this fight and getting net neutrality passed. Is there anything uh, that a regular average person can do now to ensure that this continues? It's kind of sit and wait time now. I mean, even, even, even myself, I'm kind of waiting for this thing to come out, you know, so that the experts can really get a hold of it, go through it, you know, with a fine tooth comb, um, you know, it will, you know, We'll want to wait months to see, you know, what kind of challenges end up in, in front of the FCC over, you know, things like how Netflix interconnects with Comcast and that kind of business relationship that emerges. So, you know, um, there, there are some things that, you know, you know, we'll, we'll see. But as far as what people can actually do, uh, you know, I would say the best thing is just stay informed. You know, the more you know, uh, the, the easier it's going to be able to parse kind of, you know, the uh, misinformation from the actual important fact that's out there. But, yeah, as far as any more John Oliver kind of, you know, Internet-led uh, 
you know, charges. I think that that time has passed. <laughs> Hey, Jason, have, have any of the internet service providers or broadband providers come out in, in sort of at least a quote unquote neutral way or even a positive way? I mean, has, it's a crazy question, but have, have anyone, have, have any of them viewed this as a positive development? I think some of the smaller ones, you know, feel that it's going to it's going to help them compete, uh, you know, with the much bigger ISPs. Um, I think maybe a little bit of the language that's come out from even the major ISPs hasn't been as aggressive as, as originally thought. And that has to do with what's called uh, this crazy word called forbearance, which is just a great legalese term, which basically means that some of the, the new rules that are going to be applying to the ISPs, you know, not all of them do. They're, they're going to pick out a few different rules that, you know, aren't going to affect the ISPs. And that's a good thing because there's certain elements of this new law that they're using that are very threatening to their businesses. So things like what's called rate regulation, basically getting to tell the ISPs how much they should charge. The FCC has said, we're not going to do that. You know, that's going to be a piece of this that is not used and not enforced. Um, you know, that's the kind of thing that has, I think, allied some fears about uh, FCC overreach. But in general, the ISPs, the major ones, have I've kept a pretty straight line that this is a terrible rule. So, Jason, you're in New York, and uh, there was some biz, big news from NASDAQ this morning. Uh, what happened there? Yeah, so the NASDAQ hit, uh, I think it's 5,000 for the first time since the dot-com bubble. Um, you know, it's a bit of a big round number type thing. It, it doesn't mean too, too much, but it is, you know, kind of a return to that kind of market level where there's a lot of money being invested in tech. Uh, there's a lot of people not sure how wise that was. Certainly, you know, in hindsight with the tech bubble, it wasn't. There's a lot of people who think this time it's quote unquote different. Right. So no more sock puppets. <laughs> yeah, uh, actually, I mean, Jason, do, do you think it's different? I mean, the question, the reason I raise the question is I also track venture capital and, and where angels are investing. And the valuations are, are really, many of them are sky high at this point. You've, you've got lists like the billion dollar startup list with, with valuations of startups over the billion dollar mark. For me, it is starting to feel just a little scary. And I realize many of these high valuations, at least the companies have profits this time. Mm -hmm. But I'm not so sure we're not in, in a dangerous bubble scenario again. I mean, there, there's plenty of people who would agree with you and say that the amount of money that is flying around is unconscionable. And there's, you know, almost no way to uh, justify the fact that new, like multiple companies being in this range, maybe one or two of them will pan out, but they all can. That's kind of one of the, the main arguments against these levels. At the same time, I think when you look at some key indicators, like how much money these, some of these companies are making versus how they're valued, Yes, like you just said, right. like those earnings really do go a long way towards saying that, no, these are these are better investment opportunities that, you know, aren't quite as, you know, frothy or overblown as the earlier ones. Um, yeah, I, I mean, it's, it is up to a lot of, um, you know, opinion and speculation, but it's certainly at this point something worth considering. Well, thank you, Jason. Jason is the reporter at, uh, the business reporter at Mashable, and uh, we will, I'm sure, talk to you soon again. Yeah, great. Thanks a lot, guys. Thank you. Google Plus is minus one leader, David Bespris, and plus a new one, Bradley Horowitz. Horowitz will take over Google Plus, according to a very carefully worded post on Google Plus. He calls the new service Photos and Streams. What do you think about this, Joe? Yeah, you know, it, it, it's an interesting, an interesting effort by Google to really control the message. And you worry, or I worry at least, that that this may be the last time around for Google Plus. I mean, I don't already worry. people on. <laughs> you know, though I do, and and here's the reason why. Um, Mike Elgin actually turned me on to the service in terms of the great SEO that it offers um, for, for content people like me in, in terms of my day to day reporting and writing. I always get that great Google Plus lift um, from the service. And, and it's pretty clear within the halls of Google that, that Google Plus is a hot potato that no one really wants to hang on to and they keep passing it to the next executive. And, and now it's even unclear to me whether or not the term Google Plus, the brand Google Plus moves forward or if, if, um, if Bradley is really repositioning the whole thing at this point. So as a promotional tool, you like it, but do, I mean, do you use yeah, it just it. as connecting with friends or family or do you use it for anything uh, else really? Yeah, a little bit, but but no. To your point, not as much. I will tell you about one emerging service that we haven't talked about on this on the uh, the show yet. It's called Comlink. It's it's more of a LinkedIn alternative, and it's more of a B two B connectivity uh, approach. So I've been using that more and more for my B two B connections. Again, Comlink.com. But um, Google Plus, yeah, for me, it's all about promoting uh, so, some of the content, but maybe not about the connections. I have to give that to you. Okay. 
right, well, moving on, a representative from Twitter is reporting that their security team is investigating alleged reports that Islamic State militants have made threats against Twitter co-founder Jack Dorsey and other Twitter employees. Yeah, you know, it, it seems like Twitter's caught, I, and I'm sorry to even use this term, but, but they're caught in this crossfire here between the terrorists and, and also um, organized governments. It was only a couple of weeks ago where France and other governments were really pushing Twitter and, and other social networks, by the way, to, to take down that terrorist propaganda as soon as each government made an alert to Twitter and others. So um, I, I would not want to be in the social media platform business at this point in terms of uh, the back and forth and, and the way they're getting caught between um, the bad guys and hopefully the good guys. Well, yeah, I mean, especially Twitter, because they really are a vehicle for speech for so many people. And so they, they're, they've taken on a lot. Um, it's not just cat photos for them. So, I, you know, I, right. I hope they're up to it. And today at Mobile World Congress, Android and Chrome head Sundar Pichai said that they are entering the wireless game, but not in the way you might expect. Pichai said the service will not be designed to compete with the four major carriers, but rather would be a place to exhibit tech innovations that others could adopt. Yeah, and I view this as good news. You know, it, it, Google, on the one hand, is trying to get broadband everywhere and wireless everywhere so that they can pump up search everywhere. But on the other hand, it, they're looking at this, uh, this broadband and wireless push as a way to show off innovation. And, you know, it, it, it's always interesting. You build the platform and then you wonder what type of apps will, will be exposed on the platform. And I think that's Google's exact mission here. Yeah, it seems like a lot of what they do is just like proof of concept kind of thing. Well, here, you know, um, we're just going to throw it out there and see what happens. Just a placeholder for the rest of us. Reuters reports that Intel is launching new chips for low-end smartphones. This is an effort to keep up with leading chip maker Qualcomm and to meet demand, especially Chinese demand for smartphones that cost under $100. The chips are codenamed Sophia, and many devices with these chips are already on display at Mobile World Congress this week. Yeah, you know, give Intel some credit here. Certainly, they continue to push hard with mobile, but let's not forget the real numbers. In Intel's most recent year, they had a $4.2 billion loss in the mobile market. And then in the previous year, in, in 2013, the loss was $3.1 billion. So on the one hand, they're doubling down on mobile, but not many people and not many organizations could afford these types of losses year after year. And Uber is also in the news again. They've confirmed that driver, not customer information, was hacked in 2014. It was a one-time hack that involved a small percentage, they say, of current and former Uber partner drivers, names and license numbers that were in the Uber database. But the small percentage actually involves 50,000 drivers. Uber discovered the, this in May 2014 and in September 2014, and they're only confirming it now. Yeah, you know, what's really interesting here, Jason, if you could show the link from uh, the Uber blog, is um, they have a legal advisor now at Uber. Her name is Catherine Tassi, and you'll notice that she wrote the blog, and she sort of put the spin on what's going on with in, uh, inside Uber and how they're addressing this. And her title is, is basically, she's a legal expert who's handling privacy issues for Uber. And, and this is a growing trend across the industry. Everyone's sort of lawyering up now to, to mitigate and or minimize uh, the breach issues. It's almost, um, I don't want to say it's quite in response to the Sony incident because uh, she, uh, Catherine apparently joined Uber back in the August timeframe, but uh, Uber allegedly found the incident in September and the incident happened in May. So the timing to all this is, is quite interesting to me to say the least. It is. Uh, yeah, Uber should have some lawyers, probably a lot of them. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> HP this morning confirmed plans to buy Aruba Networks for about $3 billion, including $2.7 billion in cash and debt. The buyout gives HP deep Wi-Fi enterprise networking expertise. What are your thoughts on this, Joe? You know, this one's near and dear to me because I, I do cover the B2B market very closely in the enterprise market. And I'll just throw out some quick stats and some history here. So in, in HP's most recent quarter, their sales in the networking business fell about 11%. I think that was the most recent number I saw. So, you know, on the one hand, HP's trying to pump up networking as, as it competes with Cisco. But it's also about showing some progress ahead of the big HP breakup. Don't forget, HP is going to break into two companies later this year. One is HP Enterprise, and that's where Aruba, this networking company, is going to go. And then the other is HP Inc., and that's where uh, PCs and printers are going to go. So, so the enterprise division is really trying to show some progress with this buyout. 
But let's look at HP's M&A history here. It, it's mixed at best. And in some cases, it's, it's dramatically bad. You know, you had the notorious autonomy buyout. Autonomy, that deal was a bust. It was overvalued. There was a court battle over the accounting practices uh, ahead of that buyout. Um, over at Autonomy, not at HP, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, there was the Palm OS and Web OS buyout, and, and that was a huge miss. There was 3Com, which was sort of mixed, but there was some success. There was um, HP had purchased a 3PAR in the storage market, and that has been that has been a good showing. So, so HP is really trying to show that Aruba can be a tuck-in rather than a big uh, organizational mess as part of this buyout. We'll see. Yes. Well, when we discussed this this morning, you said you were really interested in this, and and I hear your interest. Um, unfortunately, I I can't match it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll see. You know, I I, I think um, there were some uh, out on our blog on afternines.com. There, there, I got a few private messages where where people were saying that Cisco was actually celebrating this deal because of HP's notoriously poor uh, handling of M and A, and Cisco thinks HP will get totally distracted by this deal. I wouldn't be celebrating that loudly. I think HP and, and Aruba here could could make some progress together. We'll see. All right. Well, in our big numbers section, 64, that's the number of dollars that the new Xiaomi sport camera will cost, according to TechCrunch. That's compared to the under $130 price of a GoPro Hero. The camera is called the Xiaomi Yi, and it's only available in China for now. And in the news you can lose section last Thursday, I spent 24 hours without internet or cell phone access. When I came back online, I realized that everyone in the entire world was talking about a blue dress and it wasn't the same one we were all talking about in 1998. So I know you've already seen the pictures of this dress and read about the debates about what color it is. It's brown and blue, by the way. Uh, Daniel Howland, a 24 year old man from Texas believes that this isn't just an internet fad. Buzzfeed reports that Howland tattooed a picture of the dress on his leg, when he was asked why, he said, I didn't see a reason why not to, which is a great reason to do anything. What do you think about this story, Joe? Well, you know, ahead of the program, you were talking about your nine-year-old sons. I've got sons around the same age, and it sounds like one of their standard answers. So, I, you know, I do worry a little bit about uh, some of the people that get courted out in media. But then again, uh, you know, uh, hopefully I educate my sons a little bit better and uh, they don't go down this path. Well, you have a lot of skin space. I mean, if you're going to tattoo it all, you got to, I mean, you know. I yeah, you know, ideas. it's funny you should mention them. <laughs> my son actually brought up tattoos last night and I did warn him that one of the bad things is over time you will gain more and more skin space for that tattoo as you age. So uh, careful what you stamp on yourself. That's a good point. Uh, if you have no idea what dress I'm talking about, then you have a much more interesting life than the rest of us do. And we'll link to that Wired story explaining the science behind this internet meme in our show notes. You know, a lot of investors are charged high fees and hidden costs by their traditional brokers, mutual funds, and on 401ks. These costs add up and could steal years from your retirement. Personal capital is free and secure, and it's already helping more than 700,000 investors just like you identify and eliminate high fees and manage and grow their wealth. It's your money. Keep more of it. It's time to trade up. Your broker may be taking money from your pocket with hidden fees and no transparency, they win and you lose, but not with personal capital. With personal capital, you get award-winning tools, unbiased advice, and a transparent view of your investments. It's a win-win. Personal capital is a complete, intuitive financial dashboard with all your accounts in one place so you can make smarter financial decisions and manage your portfolio like a pro. You, If you have high risk tolerance, you have different time horizon, that everybody has different financial goals and retirement planning is really different depending on what your goals are. So you can talk to an advisor at Personal Capital and figure out what your goals are and what you need and when. It's a new free offer. All you have to do is track your accounts worth $100,000 or more on the Personal Capital dashboard and you will qualify for a 30 minute review. You also get tailored advice on optimizing your investment. So why wait? Take control of your financial future. Personal Capital gives you total clarity and transparency to make better investment decisions right away. You can also get a free, no obligation portfolio consultation when you link $100,000 or more in assets on the personal capital dashboard. It's easy to do and the results may benefit you the rest of your life. As soon as you link your accounts with $100,000 or more in assets, personal capital will contact you for a free 30 minute portfolio consultation 
Just set up your free account at personalcapital.com slash TNT. And we thank Personal Capital for their support of tech news today. And finally, our TNT fan of the day is Joe Cook of Northern Indiana. He watches TNT while multitasking at work. Thanks for squeezing us in, Joe. There he is. <laughs> There's Mike. Thank you so much. How do you watch or listen to TNT? Just record a video or take a picture of yourself or your setup and post it on Google Plus, Twitter, or Facebook and use the hashtag how I watch TNT and we'll find it. And Joe, where can everyone find you? Uh, you can always find me over at afternines.com. And in terms of what we're up to this week, you can visit afternines.com slash CEO. That's where we post our weekly podcast. And this week's conversation uh, has to do with one of the biggest tech events of the year. It's going to be in New York. It's called New York Tech Day. It's for venture capitalists. It's for uh, angel investors. And it's for tech startups. Apparently, there's going to be about 15,000 people there. So check out the details over on afternines.com slash CEO. And that podcast runs tomorrow. Excellent. Thank you. And you can subscribe to Tech News Today on Stitcher, iTunes, YouTube, Feedly, Yahoo, RSS, and many other options. Please leave a review and let us know how you like the show. You can also choose your favorite way to subscribe at twit.tv slash TN2. And you can watch us live every weekday at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern, 1800 UTC at live.twit.tv or on the app on your browser plugin of your choice. If you're ever in San Francisco, come by and watch us live. And uh, you just need to email tickets or just come on by. We'll find a space for you. Follow us on Twitter at Tech News Today TV. And if you're a technology news fan, and I know you are, come hang out with us in our Google Plus community while you still can. Just search Google Plus for Tech News Today. Subscribe to our subreddit at technewstoday.reddit.com. And let us know what you think. Send us an email to tnt at twit.tv or call 260 TNT show. And we thank Joe for his help today. And don't miss tech news tonight at 4 p.m. Pacific every weeknight. I'll be hosting that today. That is all for tech news today. Thank you for watching. My name is Megan Maroney. We'll see you tomorrow. 